Welcome back to The Living Markets. It is the start of a new year, so we're going to take a look ahead and see what 2019 may bring us. Joining me in the studio for our discussion tonight, we have Patrick Zweifel, who is Chief Economist at Pictet Asset Management in Geneva. Welcome. Hello, Anna. We have Cornelia Meyer, Economist and Energy Expert. A very happy new year and hello. Hello to you and happy new year back. Uh, we have Stefan Gerlach, Chief Economist at EFG Bank. And Daniel Cull, Chief Economist at UBS. Hello. Now, I don't know about any of you, but my big story for 2019 is, of course, Brexit and the potential we have for a hard Brexit. Uh, Cornelia, if I could start with you, what are the impacts of that eventuality? Well, sadly, you know, as you know, I live in London. I'm also British. And sadly, I think we are going... It, it looks ever more likely that we have a hard Brexit because whichever way we look, Theresa May doesn't look like she's going to get the numbers. And yes, there are people talking who cross-party about the second referendum, but by the time anything is decided, it is March um, 29 and, and we have to go out. And let's not forget, it's not just the UK, it is the EU as well. EU Parliament has to, has to approve what the UK has approved as well in order for the EU to be able to ratify. So we are in, we are in dire straits and it will be very bad indeed. It will be bad for the financial sector. It will be bad for the automotive sector. It will be bad for the chemical sector. It will because the supply chains are so integrated with Europe. These parts get shipped back and forth all the time. And in just-in-time delivery, they can't afford to be stuck in, in Calais or in Dover. Um, and we, we obviously have the SMEs, and the SMEs haven't really been able to prepare for a hard Brexit. They employ 60% of British people. They haven't been able to prepare because they don't have the money to hire all of these accountants and lawyers and so on. So if we have a hard Brexit, the IMF says we will contract by 6%. My model that I ran says we will, we will contract by 3.6%, uh, pretty in line with where the Bank of England is. OK, Stefan Gerlach, do you think this is a, a real possibility? A hard Brexit, yes. yes. I think that, that, is a real, that is a real risk, for sure. And uh, the outcome of a, of a hard Brexit would be, would be very severe, so it makes good sense to, to take that very seriously and think about what can be done to forestall it and to think about... Uh, how to adjust if this if this happened? I mean, it is an almost. It is not almost. It is an unprecedented situation, where a country will uh, cut itself uh, loose from its biggest trading partner in this way. Okay. Well, they obviously have a lot to discuss. But Daniel Carl, if we brought Switzerland into this, I mean, obviously we need to renegotiate our own free uh, trade agreements. What kind of position does this leave Switzerland in? Uh, still a very difficult one, uh, because we all know as long as the Brexit is not resolved, Switzerland will have a hard time uh, getting a good deal, be it in, on the institutional framework agreement or in developing uh, new market access agreements mm -hmm. with the EU. So we, we, we're still uh, mired in this uh, in this spectre of, of a potential hard Brexit, or they could prolong it. I mean, they could revoke uh, everything. They, it's completely unpredictable what's going to happen, and, and this makes it very very difficult also for Switzerland to go ahead. What are your impressions, Patrick, of where we are with Brexit and the implications uh, in the coming months? Yeah, I would, uh, as, as I was... Um, discussing with friends recently, obviously, and colleagues, it seems that the, um, the likelihood of having a hard Brexit is probably the highest one now. I would completely agree with you, Cornelia, on this. But I still think that the other options are still, uh, are still remain a possibility. One of them is uh, that everyone has in mind is this, two, this uh, vote in the parliament in two weeks' time. That's unlikely to happen or, uh, or unlikely to, do, to be passed, I agree. But we still have... Despite the fact that uh, May refused a second referendum, this is also one of the things that she could actually change her mind on this. And what's uh, my own experience with all these negotiations that had taken place with Europe, that like Greece in 2015, there still could be like a last minute deal done. So uh, I want to know though, I mean, how uh, impactful does this become the closer we get to kind of D-Day, Cornelia? Yeah, it, it becomes very impactful. And, you know, the comparison with Greece is a good one and it's not. For the simple reason that 
I don't think Greece internally was as divided as the UK Parliament is right now. It's just, it's unbelievable how divided the UK Parliament is. And whatever you go for, they just, there's no majority for a second referendum, no majority for a new election, no majority for the deal. So in the end, we just might slide into this, into this hard Brexit. And there is the time component. As the um, last year, the, Austria held the presidency to, um, of, the, of the European Union. And their foreign minister, Karen Kneisel, said, look, we want to give you more time, but, but the European elections, our parliamentary elections, mid-May, are, are a hard stop. OK, we could definitely talk about Brexit um, for the next several minutes. But, <laughs> Stefan Gala, what's kind of on your radar for 2019? What are some of the headwinds coming our way? Apart from Brexit. Apart from Brexit. <laughs> so, um, I, I think... Certainly trade will be a big issue this year. Um, we have to worry about what's going to happen in the European Union or in the Euro area. President Draghi will be, will be leaving at the, uh, uh, in the fall. Um, th there are ongoing concerns in, the, in emerging market economies and so on. There's quite a few things that could, uh, that could act up this, uh, this year. So uh, there, there, are, there, are, there are a number of things to worry about. OK, what would, you, what would be your number one worry then? So, um, I am a little bit concerned about how this slowdown uh, that we just started last year mm -hmm. in, uh, in, you know, in, in the fall of, of uh, or in spring of, in the summer of 2018, um, how that will pan itself out, how that will, what will happen here as, as uh, 2019 progresses. There are many possibilities. It, may, it might just have been a temporary soft patch. It may just be a moderation of growth to a more steady state average level of growth, or it could be the start of something more sinister. And you know, this is this will be um, this will be for, for, for me, I think, the key issue uh, this year. What are some of the warning signs that we should watch out for then in this kind of idea of a slowdown, Daniel Kalt? I think we have a combination of worries about the geopolitical situation in terms of trade war, trade disputes, uh, um, Europe uh, in a mess on many on many uh, dimensions, and on top of that, and that's what makes markets nervous these days, is that we see the global economy losing momentum. And really, uh, uh, is this going into something which could be close? to a recession uh, uh, over the course of this year. And until we have confirmation that the global economy is kind of stabilizing and still growing into, into the second part of, 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 of this year, I think this is what markets want to see now. And uh, we could see some de-escalation on some of the things or get the Brexit behind us, perhaps not as a hard Brexit. If, if you're optimistic, <laughs> you could... You could, you could Try to hope on that one. If that happens, we could we could we could see a more positive development. Uh, if if that continues uh, with with tensions and 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 the economy slowing, momentum um, going going down. Does anyone actually see though a recession next year, uh, later this year? I think I think that's the that's going to be the key topic this year. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be the key topic in 2020 and 2021 as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know. Uh, Everyone is talking about that. What I'd been surprised is, you know, back in 2018, we were just talking about overheating. The only story in town was rising US. And at the end of last year, we just had these recessionary fears like rising so quickly. And I think we're going to be with that for, for quite a long time. Okay. But honestly, uh, I, w I still don't see the end of the cycle like being close to us. OK, now I know everybody's desperate to talk uh, right now, but we're going to continue this lively debate after a quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back to tonight's Living Markets. I'm joined by our panellists again, and we had a big debate about some of the big topics uh, that are heading our way later this year. Cornelia, I know that you wanted to say something yeah. just before we went I can to break. See, I, can see, I can see some black swans, you know. I can see... I hope you're right, and I hope this year we can go... We will solve some of the trade disputes. The, the, the economy can take over. Certainly, we are going to. We are getting towards the end of the cycle, but some of the other black swans. You know, it's always the unknown, unknown. And one of the big unknown, unknowns is the sort of the the the, the 
the, the status of credit in China, which is just really murky and, and not well understood, and something can hit from there. There are these, these things that can hit us from left field, whilst we're all terribly worried about Brexit or we're all terribly yeah. worried about um, the, the, the Europe. These things can hit us from left field. To return to Patrick's uh, point there about the risk of a recession and so on and so forth, I very much agree with the way he sees the situation, but it's we should be humble as economists here. It's, it's important to recognize that we, our record of forecasting recessions, as good. opposed to slowdown, mm -hmm. is not very good. W what tends to happen is that we see perhaps a bit of a slowdown, but it turns out to be much worse than we had anticipated. Uh, so um, we're not good at spotting recessions. Mm -hmm. And yes, the fact that the economy has been, or growth has been moderating now for a number of months. Mm -hmm. uh, and knowing the fact that we are not going to be able to, to, to forecast this one perfectly is enough to make us worry. And that's why the markets have been worried for a while. But we, conversely, we should also be careful not to talk ourselves into a recession. A lot of this is a better self-fulfilling fulfilling uh, prophecy, isn't it, I mean, some, Somehow it reminds me, the situation reminds me a bit uh, to the situation we were in in 15, early 16. I mean, you remember, yeah. oil prices were down dramatically at the time. We had China uh, in disarray. We had also all leading indicators coming down and uh, really uh, talk of a recession. But we somehow managed to stabilise. And, and the, the global economy then into 17 went into very synchronized upswing again. So uh, if we can de-escalate some of the, the tensions that we are in, geopolitical tensions, if the Fed doesn't hike too aggressively uh, going forward, um, it seems that li like inflation pressures have come off a bit. So there's still a, a good chance that we're going to see a, a, just a soft patch. But you, yeah. you see where I'm, where I'm a bit worried is, is just, you know, the, 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 are we... When are we hiking enough? When, when, when are we not hiking enough? And what really worries me there is we probably shouldn't hike too much, but if the next recession hits, we don't have to leave us. The countries sure. are over-leveraged. Yep. Uh, the interest rates are so low. What on earth will we do? How on earth will we counter a recession? Patrick? This is, this is well, the, uh, the many points I, 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 can, I can comment on. I agree with a lot of things you, you've said. Um, but on the, on the big imbalances and the over-leverage, mm -hmm. I think that's, this is what makes this cycle very different from previous one. Yeah. And in particular in the US. So this is why I would still, I could still exp would agree with uh, uh, Stefan saying, obviously the world is slowing down, it will continue to do so, but it might be like a soft patch, soft patch because we don't have like huge imbalances apart from China. And on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on China itself, you know, I've been covering China for years, 20 years, and I, and I think I've heard over-leverage stories, uh, financial crisis prediction, like, every second year. Um, and okay, I guess, obviously, they are over-leveraged, but I guess the way it will impact the, uh, the, the Chinese economy is not really through, like, a massive financial crisis. Like, most of the time, when, when countries are over-leveraged, either they go through a big uh, crisis, or uh, this over-leverage just makes their future growth much lower. And I think this is exactly where we are in, in, in Chinese situation. And the good thing on China uh, is this, compared to uh, back 2016 or 17, that this time, with a slowing US economy um, and uh, lower oil prices, uh, those, are factors, uh, you, uh, those are factors that could actually make the, the dollar more stable, weaker, and it will clearly reduce the risk on, on China itself. What is very bad for China is a, strong, is a strong dollar, rising rates, and we're not in that situation given the slowdown that we expect there. So from our discussion so far, Brexit, China, oil prices and the general slowdown in the global economy are some of the, the big subjects for this, for this year. Um, I do actually want to bring up a subject that we covered last year, which is, of course, rate hikes here in Switzerland as well. Uh, I know that most of you took part in our SNB challenge where we asked you when you thought the SNB was going to raise rates. Um, Patrick, 
I remember that you thought they might raise rates around this time now. Uh, that doesn't look likely now. So I'm wondering if you'd like to play round two and perhaps suggest thank a new for, time. Uh, <laughs> thank you for remembering this. I so, apologise. <laughs> it, it goes back to Stefan's uh, remarks. As an economist, we need to be humble. Uh, so I was completely wrong, obviously, on, on, on that one. That's OK. Um, no, but, uh, but, <laughs> That's but, OK. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the, climate, the, the environment was different. Uh, sure. Synchronised growth was strong. And, uh, and we thought at the time that indeed uh, the SNB could actually be um, mm. uh, could actually hike before the ECB. So, so when... obviously our views have to uh, have dramatically changed uh, uh, with the new information that we've had over the uh, over last year. Um, and we would now more expect indeed the SNB to uh, start raising rates a quarter after uh, the ECB, which we expect yeah. to uh, to do it uh, next next uh, next September. Cornelia? I would, I would agree with you. You might remember in the SMB challenge, I always said the, 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 the SNB will not hike before the, before the, before the ECB hikes. It, it's just, it, 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 it but can't. But how quickly can they react? Because they don't want to have a knee jerk reaction. No, right? they will not have a knee jerk reaction. And I think it will then depend really on how the Swiss economy is doing, how, how exports are doing, and how the franc is doing. If the ECB hikes and the franc is because of other problems, the franc is incredibly high. They will be careful. It is that differential, differential between the euro and the franc. You know, the Euro, Europe is our largest trading partner. OK, Stefan Gerlach, when you took the challenge, you said September the 20th, 2019. You sticking to that? No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, I don't think the ECB will hike rates in the next fall because of the reasons that we have been discussing here. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just very important to recognise that the reason to date, historically, the SNB has tended to raise rates at about the same time as the ECB, is that the economies are very closely... Uh, mm -hmm related as as uh, as you say but that need not always be like that and i think there is no in there in principle there is no reason why the smb couldn't raise rates even if the ecb doesn't hmm. but it's unlikely surely daniel you've not played but, the game yet yeah, so, no. um, so first but, shot that at your challenge no but remember i remember <laughs> yeah, okay <laughs> no let's, let's put it this way at the earliest december next uh, next mm -hmm. december uh, which uh, if the ecb goes goes along as well uh, i think they have quite a lot of pressure by now, the, the SNB, uh, because negative interest rates in Switzerland have a lot of bad side effects. Yeah. And that's why I think they need to get out, uh, provided the ECB can, can move ahead uh, before them.